All right, listeners, I think you know that we are part of the Radiotopia Network, which is basically a network built on the idea that you should support the most creative, independent audio makers around. No one, and I mean no one, embodies the Radiotopia ethos more than Benjamin Walker and his show, Theory of Everything. Benjamin, who I've known for a long time, has been making beautiful, personal, sprawling audio documentaries for decades that help us understand the very strange world we live in. And now he has a new series called Not All Propaganda is Art. The new series goes back to the 1950s when Western security agencies like the CIA paid artists, writers, and intellectuals to fight the cultural Cold War. The CIA funds were free. I mean, no one was told what to say. Gloria Steinem, activist who sees the CIA as a sort of enlightened pal or rich uncle, there is another viewpoint. Look, if you're listening to this show, I know you like secret histories. I know you like a mix of culture and politics and shadowy figures. So what are you waiting for? Not All Propaganda is Art from Benjamin Walker. You can find it now wherever you listen or at theoryofeverythingpodcast.com. Hello and welcome to This Day in Esoteric Political History from Radiotopia. My name is Jody Avergan. This day, September 1971, women's, women's rights activist and law professor Polly Murray writes a letter to President Richard Nixon asking for consideration for the position vacated by Justice Hugo L. Black on the Supreme Court. Polly Murray writes, quote, by the time this letter reaches the White House, I suspect you will have announced your choice to fill the vacancy left by Mr. Justice Hugo Black's resignation. Since I do not expect you to see this letter, it does no harm to amuse your administrative and secretarial staff as it passes up and down the line on its way to the wastebasket. Incredible letter to write to the president of the United States. Uh, But Polly Murray goes on to write, my application is to forestall the popular misconception that no qualified woman applied or are available. This letter reflects a lot about Polly Murray, the trailblazing civil rights activist and lawyer and professor and writer and Episcopal priest. Incredible career, um, especially in that era as a woman and a person of color, someone who has come up on this show a few times. But now it's time to really get to know her and her impact here to do that. As always, Nicole Hammer of Vanderbilt and Kelly Carter Jackson of Wellesley. Hello there. Hello, Jody. Hey there. Um, So, yeah, we're going to sort of get to know Polly Murray over the course of this, but I think that letter, um, I don't know if shoot your shot was a um, (laughs) phrase in 1971, but, you know, incredible, right? To just write this letter Mm -hmm. and be like, why not me? Yeah, I absolutely love Polly Murray. I feel like she's someone, though, who came into my consciousness later Mm -hmm. in life. Like, she wasn't one of the preeminent sort of civil rights leaders that we all think of top of mind, which is unfortunate because she's really doing a lot of the hard legal work that we sort of, you know, take for granted and and really live our lives in. Um, But she's just incredible. And and you're right, we have talked about her a couple times on the show before, but I'm excited to really dive in today. I love this idea, Jodi, of shooting your shot because Actually, she shot her shot before and it worked yeah. out pretty well. Yeah. She, uh, I think we may have mentioned her in the episode in the she, she, she camps, um, the mm-hmm. uh, camps that Eleanor Roosevelt, the first lady at the time, helped to develop. And that's where Polly Murray first meets Eleanor Roosevelt. And she becomes a pen pal of the first lady and intimately connected to the White House during the 1930s and 1940s. So why not try with Richard Nixon? Who knows what could happen? Yeah, though also I think by that point understands how power works in that reference yes. to, you know, I will amuse you as you eventually throw my letter into the wastebasket is an incredible <laughs> turn of phrase. Um, yeah, Kelly, I was trying to think as you were talking about kind of like, this happens in, in a lot of things, like in music and sports and st- in, in all sort of facets, but you get the like, the person who is always the like n- person you discover a little late. You know, I feel like Polly Murray is always the one who like people discover. It's like, there's, there's bands like that that are always like, when you start to just dig a little deeper, it's always the first band you discover. And they're almost kind of like rated for being underrated or something. (laughs) Um, And Polly Murray sort of fits into that. You know, it's like, there's always that phase where you discover. And I think a lot of people sort of come late to understanding. Um, Just to put some context, and I'm curious where you want to start in terms of, you know, tracking her career and her impact. But, um, I did go to the Wikipedia page, uh, which I occasionally do. 
<laughs> and at, no, because I wanted to do this out of curiosity. I did a control F search for the word first, right? Mm. Oh, 27 times the word Whoa, first no! appears on her Wikipedia, you know, because it's just like first black woman Episcopal <laughs> priest, first uh, lo- wow. you know, uh, first law professor at her uh, university. Like, it's just incredible. Um, and, it's, wow. and it starts in the 40s and it goes all the way into, as we're discussing here, you know, into the 70s. But um, I mean, her career is pioneering perhaps is the best way <laughs> to put it. I always say, you know, she she went to the best school in the whole wide world, Howard University. My mm. mama, I always got to throw that out there. <laughs> but when I think about the fact that she's going to study law is significant. And for a couple of reasons. One, because I had a colleague who was at um, Cornell who did research on early, like, scholars of the 1940s, 50s, 60s, and like what they studied in. And a lot of them actually get their PhDs or advanced degrees and stuff like math or the sciences because it was stuff that could be proved. It was stuff that they knew like two plus two was always Mm -hmm. four. And so they would never like have someone come up against them. So they couldn't do the humanities or they couldn't do things like history or English or all of the things that were sort of subjective in nature. So the fact that she's in law school um, and at Howard Law School, this is where everyone who was anyone in the black community wanted a law education. You went to Howard. One, because it was one of the few schools that would um, educate you, but also, you know, the opportunities that she had, the relationships that she had with people like Thurgood Marshall. I mean, she is writing some incredible legal legal language legal precedents you know talking about the idea of separate never being equal Mm -hmm. um she really just set the playing field she set the terms and people didn't you know people didn't like that they didn't like that she was a woman they didn't like that she was black didn't like that she was a black woman um and so it was difficult to navigate the spaces she's in which is why I think she's not as prominent in the narratives, because she doesn't fit in with the story of Thurgood Marshall and Martin Luther King Jr. and LBJ pushing for civil rights legislation. But everywhere you look, there she is. She's doing sit-ins to integrate a restaurant in Washington, D.C. in 1943. 1943. Yeah. It's, it's so early. You know, it's obvious it's 17 years before the Greensboro sit-ins. Yeah. Um, as you said, that idea of separate. I had to check that too because I was like, "Wait, she was there, Greensboro? No, like so it's, it's early. much earlier." Yeah. yeah, and and she, you mentioned the separate never being equal. That becomes part of the brief that Thurgood Marshall uses when he's arguing Brown v. Board. She's pushing for mm-hmm. no sex discrimination in the '64 Civil Rights Act. She's one of the founders of the National Organization for Women, and so you have this person who who is there in the most significant civil Mm -hmm. rights moments in mid-20th century. And she has not been a household name. It's really remarkable. Mm. Um, But also, you know, flowing between academic work and activist work, as we've been describing, Mm -hmm. but also creative work. I mean, she was, you know, uh, hanging out with Harlem Renaissance poets uh, like Langston Hughes, and she was the first black writer. She was one of the first black writers to be accepted to the McDowell Colony in New Hampshire, which is, you know, the sort of famous writer's retreat. And so, Kelly, I'm just curious, how much is that typical, that these worlds Mm. are colliding and flowing and, you know, the world of ideas and the world of law and the world of activism Mm -hmm. are all flowing back and forth? And also, to to what extent is that maybe in some sense a way that she wasn't remembered for one thing? You know, sometimes I feel like it's you need that top line headline, like where you made your mark. And if you sort of made a big mark in a bunch of different fields, that that somehow not mean that there's a tidy story about your yeah i don't think people were prepared to talk about her because when you think about the circles that she's in and it becomes a small tight network network of circles when you think about the upper echelons of black activism the upper echelons of like black elites and black excellence it's not a whole it's only a handful a couple handfuls of people they all sort of know each other but the part of that that i think becomes difficult is that it's wrapped in all of this misogyny you know the civil rights movement was heavily male dominated now women are doing a lot of the work 
the bulk of the work, I might argue, yeah. but they're not getting they're not getting credit for it. And they're even being told, like, listen, you need to take a seat back. Listen, this needs to be for someone else. So a man needs to be the face of this. And so it's not just a forgetting, it's an erasure mm-hmm. of her identity and of her contributions that we did not quite know how to place her without and it's going to sound bad but like undermining Thurgood Marshall or hmm. undermining um Charles Hamilton Houston or or any other one of her contemporaries because men were supposed to shine and the idea of a black lawyer was unheard of a black woman lawyer a black woman lawyer I should say I also think her sexuality plays into this as well oh yeah um she was both attracted to women. She talked about herself as being a man born into a woman's body. Um, She struggled, I think, with both her sexuality and her gender identity. Mm -hmm. But it was at a time when that was both medicalized. So she was Mm -hmm. in and out of psychiatric institutions and also criminalized and considered subversive. Um, so it's it's no surprise um, that she has an FBI file, you know, the good thick FBI file. In fact, in that letter, Jody, she talks about how like, I've been pre-vetted. The this FBI is, has oh my, gosh, my information. <laughs> such a great, such a great tidbit of the letter and another example of kind of just, she was funny and she's clever and you know yeah. and just and just saying like hey you don't need to vet me the fbi already knows everything about me um is, <laughs> is remarkable um that's that's the third prong is is her queer identity yeah. i would say i mean it's it's hard to sort of back then we didn't have language for what's your pronoun you know that was not something that we um language that we used but she definitely is you know, she reminds me a lot of like Audre Lord. I mm-hmm. think of someone who's, um, you know, a black woman activist who's queer, who's always sort of ahead of her time. People just weren't ready for her. Um, and yeah, it's, you know, it's, I just, I wish that more people knew about her. So I'm really glad we're doing this, this episode. Yeah. Um, and we haven't even mentioned, you know, ordained as the first black female Episcopal priest. I mean, just incredible at the age of 66, you know, in the late 70s. Um, and that's the other thing, continuing to sort of add new chapters, not to mention credentials uh, to to her legacy. Um, on the queer identity question, I mean, we mentioned the the friendship, the relationship with Eleanor Roosevelt. I mean, I think that mm-hmm. she is a key figure. Mm-hmm. And we should also say that the Polly Murray Center, I think, sort of uses a mix of pronouns when describing mm-hmm. Polly. So, you know, they are a key figure in the Eleanor Roosevelt story and all this conversations about Eleanor Roosevelt's uh, sexuality as well. And I mean, Polly Murray often pops up in those in those narratives. And even without classifying Eleanor Roosevelt's sexuality, we do know that Eleanor Roosevelt spent a lot of time around lesbians and mm-hmm. um, particularly in in Greenwich Village in New York City, where she had an apartment. And Polly Murray was part of Eleanor Roosevelt's circle. So she would have been in a kind of queer friendly space at a time when it was not usual to have the first lady sort of um, convening queer friendly salons and things like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, even her name, Polly, is intentional, right? Mm-hmm. It's you're you're not necessarily sure if, if we're talking about a man or if we're talking about a woman. Um, it could it can seem um, a diminutive of of Paul, so it's not exactly clear. It would be different if her name was something that was more straightforward, uh, feminine gendered. But um, yeah, that's a part of her legacy too. Is her name? Yeah, I think her her given first name was Alice. Um, yeah, yeah. One of the things I think that is so um, phenomenal, too, is that we often credit Ruth Bader Ginsburg as being sort of like this legal mother in a lot of ways when we think about uh, sex discrimination and discrimination in the workplace. But Ruth Bader Ginsburg really credited Murray as helping to shape her legal reasoning when it came to sex discrimination. And so when you think about Murray's thinking of the 14th Amendment and how it was so important um, that Ginsburg listed Murray as like an honorary co-author on her Supreme Court brief for Reed versus Reed. That's massive. I don't mm-hmm. think we're talking about first. I can't think of another black woman that would be listed as a co-author on a Supreme Court brief. Um, yeah. So it's huge. Speaking of the Supreme Court, which is this kind of hook here, right? Um, there are many Supreme Court historians who probably have thought a lot about this. But, you know, if you do the alternate history of Murray ending up in the Supreme Court, which 
I think she even acknowledges it was never going to really happen. Um, but that seat goes to Lewis Powell, who is often seen as like mm. laying the foundation for the conservative, you know, modern conservatism on the Supreme Court. But that Powell seat is held for a while and then it's taken over by Anthony Kennedy, which then becomes a sort of key swing seat. But, you know, just imagine the sort of alternate history in which a Polly Murray is sitting in that seat <laughs> instead, starting yeah, in the yeah. early 70s. Um, but as she said, that was a that was never going to happen. I wonder though, like, and maybe maybe I wasn't paying attention enough to the news at the time. But how much when Katanji Brown Jackson was yeah. uh, put on the Supreme Court were people referencing Polly Murray as like a not necessarily a predecessor, but uh, someone who sets up the table in order for Katanji Brown to to be seated at. So I mean, I think there are ways in which we can think about this long lineage of black women legal scholars um that that Polly murray is at the helm of that for sure and the Polly murray renaissance predates a little bit the um appointment of justice brown jackson i think there was a lot of attention drawn to murray during that period because of this letter right that a, a black woman was putting herself forward for the supreme court and there were just these little echoes in that letter that seemed to finally come fulfilled during Justice Brown Jackson's um, appointment. Yeah. Um, so we should keep a running list because I feel like from time to time we're like, oh, this person is the Forrest Gump of this podcast or of this era. One of Forrest comes up Polly there. Yeah. Absolutely on the list, right? Keeps popping up uh, in the background, you know, connections, that, surprising connections. Um, but I don't know who else, I don't know who's on that list. We should keep it. But if listeners, if listeners want to nominate various Forrest Gumps for our podcast. Can I nominate yeah. Mary Ann Shad Carey, Ooh. who was the first black woman editor of a newspaper in all of North America and went to Howard University Law School at the age of 66. So, Do you want to like, just send us a list of Howard alums and just start to that's right. slaughter the, the Howard alum list is like long or real. Maybe it's because I was just at Howard on Saturday yeah. that I'm feeling all like nostalgia. But um, yeah, I mean, you think of Polly Murray going to law school. She certainly was not the first black woman to be there. Yeah. Um, Marianne Shedd carries there in like the late 19th century. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, yes, on the list for sure. Where did you... What'd you do when you were back in Howard? Where'd you eat? Oh, well, I didn't. Oh, no, I did eat at a good restaurant. I was like, I didn't eat anywhere. <laughs> I ate, I did this really good Mexican restaurant that, and I had these beef tacos that changed my life. What? They were so good. Amazing. Wait, but there aren't like, <laughs> so there aren't like old spots that you, that you feel like you have to go visit. No, I didn't have time. It was a mad dash. I flew in that morning and flew it, flew out that yeah. evening. Um, speaking as a Frederick Douglass speaker cool. uh, for their Frederick Douglass Association. So it was great. It was fun, but it was quick. All right. Well, I'm glad Howard is on the mind. And we will certainly um, continue to go down the list of notable <laughs> alums. That, of course, yeah. is notable alum Kelly Carter Jackson. Um, Nicole Hammer, thanks to you. Thank you, Jody. And Kelly Carter Jackson, thanks to you. My pleasure. All right. Radiotopia.